All right, this is the last video from Unit 3. This one is on China. We're going to talk about how the natural protection of China allowed it to be isolated. But the northern border was left uh, sort of exposed, so they built something huge there to protect their northern border. Yeah, you know, the Great Freaking Wall of China. Yeah, Great Wall. It wasn't just good, it was great. We'll also talk about two major philosophies, uh, sometimes classified as religions, that have an influence uh, on the rest of the world in Taoism and Confucianism. And then we'll talk about how they sort of blended with Buddhism. And that version of Buddhism, the Chinese version of Buddhism, will move all over Southeast Asia. Okay, so, so those are some of the big things along with the accomplishments that China will have uh, that will be in this video. Hope you enjoy. Unit 3, Part 3. This is on ancient China. And here are a lot of the things. Okay, in this one we're going to talk about how uh, Buddhism comes to China. We're also going to be talking about how the development of dynasties and empires played a role in China, including the construction of the Great Wall. I'm getting some help from Bubba here in the background. And then uh, we're going to talk about the impact of Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism on not only Chinese culture, but Southeastern Asia as well. The geography of ancient China is the first thing that we're going to be talking about. And, and the main thing you need to know is that classical China was sort of centered around the Huanghu River, also known as the Yellow River. And no, it wasn't yellow because of that. It had a soil that uh, flowed into it called Less. It's spelled L-O-E-S-S. -S, and it tinted the river this yellowish color that you see here in the picture. Now, China was geographically isolated. Uh, there are mountains, the Hunlan Shan, Tian Shan, and Himalayas, which separated uh, the rest of Asia from China. There was the Gobi Desert to cross, and the Pacific Ocean also provided a border for China. Now, the only place that you may notice that was open was the north. So, because of this isolation, uh, the Chinese often refer to themselves as Zhanggu, or Middle Kingdom, center of the world. And this is the symbol that represents that, Zhanggu. But eventually what happens is invaders entered China from the north. Uh, several different groups that were migrating through came in, but probably the primary group that scared the Chinese was the Mongols. The Great Wall is going to be built along that northern border for China's protection. And the ruler that does that, or starts the wall, is a guy named Qin Shuangdi, who we'll talk about. Okay, so now, on your notes, what I'd like for you to do is, first on the map, add the Yellow River, the Pacific Ocean, the Gobi Desert, and the Great Wall to your map. You may have to look some of these up. The second thing I would like for you to do is go to the back page of your notes and there's a diagram that talks about advantages and disadvantages for the geography of India and China. And compare what do you think their advantages are and their disadvantages in this, this four square box. Okay, so of course, Chinese history is sort of divided up into dynasties. And remember that a dynasty is a line of rulers from the same family. So a family controlling leadership of a country. In China, the rulers were considered to be divine, again, godlike, and that they served under what was known as a mandate of heaven. So what they believed was, as long as you had a mandate of heaven, that you would be able to keep your rule. God was happy with you. If you did something bad and God took it away, you would be overthrown or conquered. Or, to or, or you'll be slayed to dead. That, that's true. All right, the first dynasty that we want to talk about is the Shang Dynasty. And the reason we picked it first is because it's the first recorded dynasty. It also has evidence of the first writing, which is called Oracle Bones, 
where they actually wrote on bones and carved them into their symbols into the bone and then they would put fire to the bone and it would crack and their priests would read this as a way of interpreting the future the Zhao is the next dynasty that we want to talk about it is the longest dynasty uh, and of course they also had some pretty cool inventions they invented the crossbow and they did some major irrigation projects yeah the crossbow the Qin dynasty is the shortest dynasty but it may be the most influential it was Qin Shuangdi the ruler the same guy who has the terracotta army and uh, I think you guys may know him from uh, the third mummy movie yeah the, yeah yeah there's a third one and uh, the Qin is the shortest of the dynasties yeah and he uh, unified the country uh, he built the Great Wall and uh, the country itself gets its name Qin China from the Qin Dynasty okay the last dynasty that you need to know about is the Han Dynasty it is considered the most glorious dynasty because there was a long period of peace and a lot of success the Han Dynasty is famous for creating their civil service system where government jobs were based on uh, you doing the best on a test and of course they also are the ones who get the Silk Road started and Silk Road is a trade route that connected China to parts of event okay a little bit more about Qin Shuangdi though he built the Great Wall as a line of defense against invasions this is the terracotta army that he was found buried with there's a picture that I didn't want to go to okay a strong central government was created by Shuangdi and he unified the country in many ways including a unified system of weights and measures what do you want to see okay well I gotta finish the video okay so he unified the system of weights and measures and in general just was very very successful now he, people didn't necessarily like Chen Shuangdi because he burned a lot of books that he deemed unnecessary unless they served a practical purpose okay so now on your notes I need you to fill in the chart on Chinese dynasties okay you might have to do a little research on these things, but most of the information should be there. Does that sound good, Bubba? Yes. Cool. When you get done with that, I want you to sort of come up with an idea of your own. Which dynasty do you think had the biggest impact on China? And you need to explain your choice. Which one do you think it was, Bubba? Uh, the Qin? Yes. Oh, good choice. Good choice. okay so now we're going to talk about a philosophy that is known as Confucianism Confucius, Confucius was a government official whose teachings became the basis for Chinese society uh, they're sort of like a way of being uh, Confucius himself was sort of like a law enforcer and a teacher all in one uh, he believed that everyone had a role in society so if I could sum up his philosophy I would say know your role jabroni because that was very important were you a father a brother a mother a sister those were important things to Confucius now his holy book is called the Analects basically it's a book of ethics which means it's a book about principles of good conduct and moral judgment you know rules that you should live by he was very very uh, thoughtful and teaching respect for family elders and past traditions so much so that even the thought of uh, worshiping your ancestors became predominant in Chinese society okay so what were the contributions of Confucianism 
All right, the first one is is that Confucius believed that humans are good, not bad. And and from this, you know, you get the idea of respecting your elders. He also believed in a code of politeness, which is still dominant in China today. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, you know, see, you say excuse me, right? Your mama tells you to say excuse me too, right? Yeah. When? Uh, after you burp. That's a good time to do it. Yeah, that's a good code of politeness. Okay, Confucius himself believed in this idea too, uh, especially about respect for other people. His, his one word for his philosophy was reciprocity. He said, what your, yourself, what you don't want, don't do to others. That sounds a lot like the golden rule. There's also an emphasis on education, which is really, really important. And finally, ancestor worship. Uh, again, the idea that you pray to your ancestors. Thank goodness, you know, Mulan wouldn't have been near the movie if Mushu wouldn't have been in it, right? Yeah. Confucianism, the first of the traditional Chinese religions, is based on the teachings of a philosopher named Confucius, who formulated his ideas around 500 BC. Confucius developed detailed rules for personal behavior that promoted mutual respect, generosity, honor, strong family bonds, a deep sense of personal duty to society, and even the worship of one's ancestors. Confucius believed that a superior ruler, father, husband, or older brother, was naturally worthy of respect and obedience. Confucius predicted that trouble would result whenever a bad example was set. In many ways, Confucianism turned out to be much more of a system of rules for proper behavior and for good government than an actual religion. Nevertheless, the vision and ideals of Confucianism ended up uniting China and it provided the Chinese people with a strong foundation for a stable, long-lasting society. Okay, the other philosophy that we want to talk about is called Taoism. It, it literally means the way. And if I could sum it up, uh, I would say go with the flow. The founder of Taoism is a guy named Lao Tzu. Okay, he was known as the old master. Yeah, I think he was a lot like Yoda. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, me too. All right. He does look a lot like Yoda. All right, so the holy writings of Taoism were called the Tao Te Ching. And I know it has a T at the beginning, but it's still pronounced with a D. And basically what Lao Tzu said was you should renounce worldly ambitions and go with nature. What he believed is the Tao is a force that is in everything that is in nature and that people in China practice both Taoism and Confucianism, even though they seem like polar opposites. Hey, by the way, Bubba, you want to know something cool? George Lucas, the guy that made Star Wars, he got his ideas about the force from Taoism. Does that sound cool? Yeah. I think so, too. Okay, so here are the contributions of Taoism. This dude here, he's doing Tai Chi, which is an exercise to get yourself in shape, right? First is harmony with nature. Taoists believe that nature plays a role in every aspect of our life. Also, humility. In other words, you're humble. You don't think that you're the cat's meow. There are things that are better than you. And then the idea of living a simple life and creating inner peace for, for yourself. Yeah, no, he doesn't. Taoism is the second religion that played a major role in shaping Chinese thought and culture. It is a religion that offered a more relaxed and natural way of finding happiness compared to the numerous rules of Confucianism. Taoism dates back to 300 BC, but certain parts of the religion are much older. Taoism is largely based on the Book of Tao, or Tao Te Ching, 
that may have been written by a religious visionary named Lao Tzu. Taoists believe that everything in the universe arises from the Tao, a silent, pure, all-powerful force that existed before there was a heaven or an earth. The early Taoists thought that the best way to find true peace and happiness was to gain first-hand experience of the Tao by living in harmony with nature, leading simple lives, and by not acting in anger. When it began, simplicity was an important aspect of Taoism. But as time went by, Taoist temples filled up with ornate shrines, brilliantly colored statues, and bowls brimming over with offerings. This happened in part because over the centuries, Taoists adopted many ancient Chinese folk gods and began to worship them. Today, Taoist priests conduct public rituals during which they offer up prayers to the ancient gods or to other divinities that represent different qualities of the Tao. Taoists also believe that it is possible for humans to attain immortality, that is, to live forever, and that is why they worship a special group of gods whom they believe once lived on earth as human beings. Okay, so this brings me to the concept of yin and yang. Yin and yang are two opposing forces that are in nature. Yin is the cool, dark female and submissive side. Yang is the warm, light, male, aggressive side. So, the way to create harmony in your life is to balance your yin and yang. Everything in life is supposedly an interaction, like the changing of the seasons. That's yin and yang interacting. Man, I wonder if they have a pill to balance your yin and yang. You think so? Okay, so... Basically, what I want you to know is that yin and yang represented opposites, just like Confucianism and Taoism do seem to be as well. One other thing that both have in common is they both deal with the now. Confucianism and Taoism aren't trying to get you to an afterlife. They're trying to make the life you live right now better. Okay, so two other things. Uh, religions or philosophies that you need to know about from ancient China. The first is Buddhism. Buddhism arrives with Ahsoka's missionaries sometime around the collapse of the Han Dynasty. It was important because I think people, because of all the warfare and things that were going on horrible in the country, were willing to be open to a new religion. Here's a statue from India that was given to China. Now, Confucianists liked Buddhism because it had eight steps to take you to nirvana. Taoists liked it because of the meditation and the connection to nature. Now another philosophy comes along at the same time, and it was called legalism. Legalism believed the exact opposite of Confucius, that people were not good by nature, and the only way to keep them under control was to create harsh laws. That sounds rough, doesn't it? Now, the last sort of philosophy was about family. Remember what we said about Confucius and respect for elders. In the f Chinese family, the father was at the top of a very strict hierarchy. He made all the decisions about what type of job you got, how much money you made, who you got to marry. And again, the worship of ancestors was important. Women? Women had very few rights or standing in Chinese society. As a matter of fact, a woman was usually below her sons on the hierarchy. Now, one woman who did make a difference, if you look at the old scrolls of ancient China, was a woman who dressed as her father to fight in war. Now, as far as we know, this is just a myth. But guess what? It's the basis for the movie Mulan. All right, so in uh, your notes, you're going to have a diagram that we're going to use in class to talk about Confucianism and Taoism and family traits. So I'll need you to fill that out. And then I'm also going to get you to fill out a list of accomplishments when we get to the end of the notes. 
So let's talk about some of those contributions of classical China to the world. All right, the Silk Road really helped facilitate trade and contact between China and other cultures of the world. That's a seismograph, Bubba. And the thing that's important here is cultural diffusion, which we've been talking about in this unit. The idea that ideas, science, math, and cultural things like religion could be traded as well as items. Some of the things that people take from China, the civil service system, paper, porcelain, and silk. But that's not all that the Chinese invented. We know that they probably invented drill bits, the wheelbarrow, printed books, casting of bronze and iron, suspension bridges, the compass, the seismograph, and even gunpowder. Okay, just to give you an idea, this is a map of the Silk Road. And we're going to really come back to this in Unit 8 when we talk about trade. Because the Silk Road is more than just a trade route. And it's more than just a land route. It is about the sharing of culture and ideas all throughout this hemisphere. Okay, so again, I gave it to you the last time, but right now, if you, don't, if you haven't done it, fill in some of the accomplishments of the Chinese and defend which one you think is most important. Okay, so what are the big ideas for this video? China's geography left it isolated. That's why their culture develops the way that it does, and but they believe that they're the center of the world. Invasions from the north forced Qin Shi Huangdi to build the Great Wall to protect their northern border. Taoism and Confucianism will impact culture and values of China, but not just China. Korea and Japan are heavily influenced by both. And finally, China will make many contributions to science and culture throughout the ancient world through cultural diffusion, thanks to the Silk Road. Okay, that's the end of this video. I hope everyone's keeping up with your notes and your journals.